here are the eight search and sort algorithms you'll need to know to ace your coding interviews. Hi friends, I'm Maddie and I'm a senior software engineer who previously worked at Google and intern at other big tech companies like Amazon, IBM, and Microsoft. So I've definitely had my fair share of the lead code grind and data structures and algorithms cramming. Whether you're just starting your journey in tech or looking to move to your next company, understanding these algorithms is critical. In this video, I'll be breaking them down simply and talk about when and why you'd use each one. Let's dive into it. We're going to start with our search algorithms, which are all about finding specific data within a larger data set. First up is binary search. Imagine you have a dictionary and you're looking for a specific word. Would you start from the very first page and read every single word until you find it? Probably not. You'd open roughly to the middle, see if your word comes for after, and then narrow down your search to one half. That's exactly how binary search works. It's an incredibly efficient algorithm for finding an element in a sorted list. More specifically, here's how it works. You start by checking the middle element. If it's the element you're looking for, great, you found it. If it's too small, you then know your target must be in the upper half of the remaining elements, so you discard the lower half. If it's too large, you discard the upper half. You repeat this process, cutting the search space into half every single time until you either find your element or determine it's not present. As to when to use it, keep in mind that the array must already be sorted. Its space complexity is O of 1. It uses a constant amount of extra space. Its time complexity is O of log n. Next up, we have depth first search, or DFS. Think of DFS like exploring a maze. You pick one path and you go as deep as you possibly can down that path until you hit a dead end or find the exit. If you hit a dead end, you then backtrack to the last decision point and try a different path. DFS is primarily used for traversing or searching tree or graph data structures. Like in the maze, you'll explore as far as possible along each branch before backtracking. It's often implemented using a stack, either explicitly or implicitly through recursion. You should use Use DFS to explore all nodes in a connected component, to detect cycles in a graph, for topological sorting, and for finding connected components. Its space complexity is O of H, where H is the height of the tree or graph. In the worst case scenario, H can actually be the number of nodes if the graph is a linked list. Its time complexity is O of V plus E, where V is the number of vertices and E is the number of edges, as it visits each vertex and edge once. Next, let's look at breadth first search, or BFS. If DFS is like going deep into one path, BFS is like exploring layer by layer or level by level, starting from your initial point. Imagine dropping a pebble in a pond. The ripples spread outwards uniformly. BFS works similarly, visiting all the direct neighbors of a starting node, then all of their unvisited neighbors, and so on and so forth. DFS is also used for traversing or searching tree or graph data structures, but it explores all the nodes at the current depth level before moving on to nodes at the next depth level. It's typically implemented using a queue. You should use it to find the shortest path in an unweighted graph for social networking features, for example, like finding friends within a certain degree of separation, or to find all nodes within a certain distance from a source node, or for web crawling. DFS's space complexity is O of V in the worst case, where V is the number of vertices, as it might need to store all the vertices in the queue. Its time complexity is O of V plus E, where V is the number of vertices and E is the number of edges. Okay, so that covers our top three search algorithms. Now let's shift gears and talk about sorting. Sorting algorithms are all about arranging data in a specific order. Our first sorting algorithm is merge sort. Merge sort is a classic example of a divide and conquer algorithm. Imagine you have a giant stack of unsorted papers. Merge sort tells you to divide that stack in half, then divide those halves in half, and so on and so forth until you have a bunch of individual papers, which are inherently sorted. Then you start merging these sorted individual papers back together two at a time, then four, then eight, etc., ensuring that each merge stack is also sorted. This continues until you have one fully sorted stack. You should use it when stability is important as it is a stable sort, meaning that it preserves the relative order of equal elements. And for external sorting, for example, when data is too large to fit into memory. Merge short space complexity is O of N, where N is the number of nodes because it requires extra space proportional to the input size for merging. Its time complexity is O of N log N in all cases, best, average, and worst, because it always divides the list into two halves and takes linear time to merge them. Next up, we have quicksort, another powerful divide and conquer algorithm. Quicksort is, as its name implies, often one of the fastest sorting algorithms in practice. Imagine you're sorting a deck of cards. You pick a card, it's called a pivot, and then you rearrange the rest of the cards so that all cards smaller than the pivot are to its left, and all cards larger than the pivot are to its right. Now the pivot is in the correct sorted position. You then recursively apply the same process to the subdecks on either side of the pivot. The 
The core idea in Quicksort is partitioning. It selects that pivot element from the array and then partitions it over and over again. You should use Quicksort for general purpose sorting where the average case performance is critical and when memory space is a concern because it sorts in place unlike merge sort. Quicksort is O vlog n on average due to the recursive call stack. In the worst case, it can actually be O of n. Quicksort's time complexity is O of n log n on average, but it could be O of n scored in the worst case if the pivot selection is consistently bad. However, in real life, you should have good pivot selection strategies which make the worst case rare in practice. But before I talk about the last algorithms, I want to thank today's video sponsor, Brilliant. If you're someone like me who has struggled with programming concepts in the past, Brilliant's collection of courses is a great way to build timeless problem-solving skills to thrive in the ever-evolving world of programming. From learning Python to developing an intuition for computer logic, you'll get hands-on experience with real programs and learn to think like a programmer. Brilliant helps you become an analytical problem solver with thousands of visual interactive lessons in all sorts of technical topics like math, science, programming, data analysis, and AI. It first starts you with mastering the foundations before it then helps you level up to increasingly challenging problems. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash Zhang, scan the QR code on my screen, or click on the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks again to Brilliant for supporting the channel. Now let's talk about heap sort. This algorithm leverages a special tree-based data structure called a heap. Specifically, it uses a max heap, which is where the parent node is always greater than or equal to its children, or a min heap. Imagine you have a pile of items and you always want to quickly find the largest one. A max heap allows you to do that very effectively. Heap sort works by first building a max heap from the input array. Once the heap is built, the largest element is at the root. You then swap the root with the last element of the heap, reduce the size of the heap by one, and then heapify the new root to maintain the heap property. You repeat the process until the heap is empty and your array is sorted. You should use heap sort when you need a guaranteed O of n log n worst case time complexity, unlike quick sort, or when you want an in place sorting algorithm with good performance. The space complexity of heap sort is O of 1 because it's an in place sorting algorithm. The time complexity is O of n log n in all cases, best, average, and worst. Moving on to some specialized sorting algorithms. Let's talk about counting sort. This one is quite different from the comparison based sort we've discussed so far. Imagine you have a pile of exam papers with scores from 0 to 100 and you want to sort them. Instead of comparing every single paper, you could just count how many papers receive a score of 0, how many receive a 1, and so on and so forth up until 100. Then you simply reconstruct the sorted list based on those counts. Counting sort works effectively when the range of input numbers is not significantly larger than the number of items to be sorted. It doesn't rely on comparing every element with everyone else, but rather on determining for each input element the number of elements less than it. You should use it when you have integer values with a small known range. The space complexity is O of k, where k is the range of input values. The time complexity is O of n plus k, where k is the range and n is the number of elements. This can be very fast if k is small. Our final sorting algorithm is radix sort. This is another non-comparison based sorting algorithm and it's quite clever. Imagine you have a list of phone numbers that you want to sort. Radix sort would sort them by the last digit, then by the second to last digit, and then so on and so forth until all the digits have been used. Each pass through the digits uses a stable sorting algorithm like counting sort. More specifically, it sorts numbers by processing individual digits and works by grouping those numbers by those individual digits which share the same significant position and value. For example, it might sort all the numbers by the ones place, then the tens place, then the hundreds place, etc. You should use radix sort when sorting integers with a large number of digits or a very wide range, but you can break them down by place value. The space complexity of radix sort is O of n plus k, where n is the number of elements and k is the range of values for each digit. So for example, 0 to 9 for your typical decimal digits. Its time complexity is O of d times the sum of n plus k, where d is the number of digits, n is the number of elements, and k is the base of those numbers. So for example, 10 for decimal. This can be very efficient for certain data distributions. And there you have it. These are the top search and sort algorithms for coding interviews that you should know. For search, we have binary search, DFS, and BFS. And for sort, we have merge sort, quick sort, heap sort, counting sort, and radix sort. I'm going to go ahead and insert a chart here that summarizes the space and time complexity complexities for these. Keep in mind that it's not just about knowing how to implement these algorithms, it's actually about knowing the complexities and being able to explain why one might prefer one over another for a given problem. And that's all I have for you in this video. If you found this video helpful, hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. And let me know in the comments below what tactical topics you want to see me cover next. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.